in the, the, the early 1980s, I was very interested in realizing that there's a lot of older folks who have been doing this for their whole lives, who are in their 70s, their 80s, their 90s, who aren't going to be around much longer. And I wanted to seek them out and find them and, and learn what it is that they know and, and, and try to make sense. And I had been calling for a while, but I had only been learning from people who had been calling a little bit longer than me, two years to five years longer. And I loved what they were doing, so I was studying what they were doing. But I wanted to go deeper because I realized they had gone deeper. And then I realized there was this incredible wealth of square dances in the three counties of southwestern Pennsylvania. And so I started going to these dances and was amazed what I found. Dozens of callers, scores of musicians, dancers who were retired people who that's all they, they went from one dance to the other in these rural areas. And this was all 50 miles from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. None of the Pittsburgh dancers knew anything about counties that border both West Virginia and the northern panhandle of West Virginia and, and, and some of Maryland. And the favorite I found was Jerry Goodwin. And at the time, I was in my 30s, and he was in his 70s. And I spent a year, you know, just going to his dances, videotaping them, and then taking the videos to his house and looking at them with him and saying, so tell me about this, tell me about that. And then I would interview the musicians at the dances, and I'd interview the dance organizers, and I'd interview the dancers, and just trying to understand the social fabric. And what I realized was I knew nothing, <laughs> because the only thing I knew was that very superficial filter that I was looking at the world through, which was my experience, which is, you know, a, a, you know, a tiny drop in an ocean. And so... I was in another world now. I was in another world in terms of commu a community, a, r a very rural community and a hard-edged rural community of coal miners, of steel workers, of farmers, um, some ranch uh, ranchers. And, and, I, uh, and I just stopped advocating for what I knew and instead was open to what was new and it was all new. And what I realized in talking to Jerry once w w when he showed me, w we were looking at video and I said, that's a beautiful dance. Where'd you get that from? He goes, oh, my dad. And I said, when did he pass? And he, he told me about it. And Jerry and I both realized at that moment that Jerry was the only person who called that dance that his dad called. And when he was gone, where would that end up? Because this is an oral tradition. None of these dances were ever written down. Jerry's dad never wrote down a dance. His brother, who was a caller, never did. And Jerry didn't. They just know it. It's kind of like a singer knows words. Unlike, let's say, contra dance calling, where everyone has their box of cards, at, or they have it in their computer or their iPads or whatever, this was different. This is a, an oral tradition. It's like you learn a folk song. You know Lady around the lady, gent follow, lady around the gent, but gent don't go. You know, you just, it's something you know. And so what I realized, what Jerry helped me realize is that, that we're all links in this chain in these oral traditions, where Jerry was the link in the chain between his father and me. And if Jerry wasn't there, this rich oral tradition could be lost, or at least that part of it. And then I realized, and this is what really gave me incredible humility, I didn't know who the next link would be for me. I didn't know who that was going to be. And that's when I started teaching other callers. And it's also when I started focusing more on that style of dance, not to the exclusion of other things, but really focusing on it. And so I guess where it leaves me in terms of all this talk about square dancing and traditional dancing versus modern or squares versus contras is as leaders, as callers, as musicians, if we see ourselves more as links in this chain, it doesn't mean we don't innovate and that this isn't a dynamic process, but I think it means we have a responsibility to have reverence for that which came before us so that if we do innovate, we're doing so in an intentional way and an informed way that we know that, yeah, they did it like that in the late 1800s, but one example is I'm not going to refer to women in demeaning ways that they might have back then. They used to talk about changing your, a woman as a partner as trade her in for two bits. Well, no, I'm not going to do that now. But I want to know that that's what they did. 
and so that when I make my choices now with words or language, it's in an informed way. So I think if we see ourselves as these links in the chain and have reverence and respect and honor those who came before us, um, number one, it's going to help those traditions live. Uh, two, it's going to make where we are now stronger because it has a firmer foundation. And it has a foundation based more on the whole ecology of dancing, not just a piece bunch of, of figures. Exactly. Not just a bunch of figures, but figures that were danced to this kind of music in this kind of hall with these kinds of people for these kinds of purposes. And it's good. So there's lots of good. So, so that was the humility that, that I think that I really learned the most from the, the, these traditional callers was to recognize our roles as links yeah. in the chain. Wherever it was, what they'd do is they'd have a couple squares and then they'd sing a couple of songs or there'd be a waltz or you know a polka or a shottish or something like that. And so that's what happened at these dances. So Jerry, who I studied with, he would call three squares, three tips, or some people call them changes. He'd do three changes, then about three couple dances, then three squares, etc. He'd call 18 squares in one night, plus two or three couple dances between each one. It's a lot of music and a lot of dancing. Hmm. And the, the couple dances were phenomenal. You know, they were um, waltzes, polkas, shottishes, foxtrots, something they called the slow dance, which was sort of a foxtrot. They did the Jesse polka. They did the peerless. They did the rye waltz, you know, dances that were collected in the 20s in you know dance books that and so so it was it was you know just a, a great lesson for me to realize that if we could look at all this through more naive eyes and fresh eyes rather than compare it to what we're used to saying oh I'm a modern western square dancer this is odd or I'm a contra dancer this is odd or whatever it is but rather take it at face value, saying, this is what this is, let's learn what that is, and then maybe, you know, compare and contrast it to what I know, rather than look at it through the lens of what I know. And that, that's a very difficult thing to do, but I think it's worthwhile, especially when we want to be links in that chain and want to be true to. And like I said, the, the word that, that to me that fits it more is, is to have reverence for that, yeah. honor that.